Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the Lusters of Europe. I'm your host, as you probably know, Chinese Mo Mr. Mocha Lover. But right now, we must read about an interview with the economist, or an economist, continued. I returned home to Nanjing with empty pockets and found a penthouse that has been rep repossessed. Funnily enough, my American sports car has not been due to how it's been illegally smuggled in. I was forced to live in a convertible for a couple months before I found a job at Nanjing University teaching as an assistant professor. As the crisis quieted down, Chinese businessmen realized something. Now that Japanese businessmen were gone, the economy would be significantly more stable. So in the strangest turn of events I had ever seen, the markets boomed for a short amount of time. And in that time, fortunes were made. The parties resumed. The penthouses of Nanjing were occupied. This time, I declined to indulge. I had seen the writing on the wall. The economy was only stable with safe investing. Wide reporting on the stability of stocks meant that hundreds of thousands oversaturated in the market. My dear economist friends were again de delegated to the streets, and so the cycle continues, and we're about to finish up, and so do jobs, in which up next we're going to go ahead and do Japanese brain drain, I don't really like that one, um, closing up shop would be okay, so we can open up a new shop, so closing up shop. Within the major cities across China, China's pulling of putting signs in the windows of Japanese owned establishments has begun. These signs read, close, thank your president. The Japanese left it as a snide jab before packing their bags, but their real humiliation ought to be the decrepit buildings they left in their wake. Which is not very good, but it is 1970. Hope you're having a great, great new decade, everyone. Hopefully we can qu do quite well, even though we've already maxed everything out for industry for 1970. An interview with a cafe owner. He, we walked in as he shines up, shines cups for what it seems like forever. He will not do anything with dirty or anything dirty for his dear customers. This cafe has been open for as long as my grandfather's grandfather could remember. They said it's the first restaurant in Beijing. I wouldn't bet on it to be honest, but I do know it's old. See that painting on the wall? That's my great great grandfather. He was a court official. Opened this place up for soldiers to eat sometime early in Qing, I reckon. Technically, I shouldn't even be doing anything in here, as it's old enough to qualify as a historic monument. There are some old chairs here. I'm not really sure where they went. I'll look later. That day, back all the way to the Yuan, I think. Could probably make a fortune off those, anyways. This is what was left to me. Issue was, during the crisis, a mob of angry Chinese guys came on over and demanded I hand over ownership of the place to the Chinese and get out of the country. Now, here's the thing. I ain't Japanese. These guys, in all their mob-filled anger, couldn't hear uh, my speaking perfectly composed Mandarin. If they did, they ignored it in the name of the crowd. They burned down half of the bad replace until I got a hold of the police and they shut it down. A mess that was. Almost burned down my whole place, which is not very cool. But we have some comments to go through, but let's read about setting up shop first. Despite the Japanese intending the message as a rallying point against the government, Chinese shop owners have taken a liking to the phrase and have used it as their own stores. Proudly displayed in the front of the stores, owned and operated by our businessmen. The sign now reads, Profitable, thank your president. <laughs> That's funny. That's good. That's good stuff. Ah, still minus 10 billion. Almost 10 billion. Man, that GDP growth, not very good, man. But still setting up shop is very good to do. An interview with a factory worker. One of the millions of workers in China. He labors in a large factory on the outskirts of Shanghai. Stocking well built, he's not one to fight. There's this whole perception that every Japanese factory owner was a terrible rapist or murderer or some sort of stuff like that, and it's completely wrong, sure. There were more than a few bad eggs, but there were just as many businessmen playing paying fair wages with good benefits. But the public and Gao decided it would be best to throw the whole carton on the ground as opposed to going through each one to check which was spoiled. It's a shame, really. Last I heard my former boss, he was begging on the streets of Nagasaki, lost everything after the crisis. And here I am, cushy jaw with a cushy seat. I know it's strange, but I feel bad for him. Good eggs get thrown al away along with the rest, which is really quite unfortunate. Oh, we can still clamp down on corruption. Hey, do we really want to do that 26%, 47%, 52%? This would be nice, but oh, we're already losing so many consumer goods, it's not even funny. So we have one, two, three. We're already working on industry, which is pretty good as well. So, <clears throat> de facto sanctions. Um, I don't, I don't like that. Increases this daily political power, but hurts probably the consumer goods factors and decreases research speed. Uh, let's do de facto sanctions first. The final step of our effort to expel the Japanese is to levy harsh restrictions on the Zabatsus, forcing them out of China without technically expelling them. This should keep us from outright feuding with our near and dear friends across the Yellow Sea. But we'll see what happens. Cool, someone also said in the comments from the last video that we should go down all three routes and try it out sometime. Yeah, maybe sometime, I'm not sure. We'll see. The balance approach would be very cool to do, as well as let them fester just to see what would happen if we cover up all the Japanese atrocities here. But you never know, and we do have a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and warm. Rejecting Ruo Kua uh, demands, huh? Our records. Okay, advanced artillery, cool. 
very good. Coffee is always good to have. Well, maybe not always, but usually pretty good to have. <clears throat> An interview with the factory worker continued. When the businessman was kicked out of China, there was a vacuum in town. He didn't just act as a leader of the factory, he also acted as a representative as a, as a suburb. Lucky for me, I got the chance to fill space. Workers liked me and kind of just put me in the pedestal. Sure, issue was. I didn't have any experience with finances or leading, so I pointed to some guy to deal with the money side, and I was just kind of sat in an armchair and acted nice. Well, like, wait, you're not you're not going to put this in the book, are you? Okay, good. Okay, yeah. So yeah, maybe I do feel bad for the Japanese businessman. It's not like I ever got up to anything good around here. Wages are the same, benefits are the same. Now they got a Chinese man masquerading as a boss. Shame it is, but rejecting the records. One of the most popular st styles of music throughout the Cold Prosperity Sphere is Ryukouka. A style of popular music from the home islands that combines traditional Japanese chord progressions and themes with modern Western instrumentation and singing styles. Its popularity rose in China after its introduction by Japanese settlers, who brought with them their favorite songs from back home, as well as Japanese record labels seeking to expand their markets to new regions. But there are those in our society whom these humble imported records have since become a symbol of quiet oppression, a 12-inch tool of cultural imperialism. In recent years, many juvenile delinquents, better, bitter ex Chiang supporters, and other rabble rousers have begun to vocally revolt against what they see as Japanese intrusion into the Chinese home life. Some have been more vocal than others in Beijing, Hong Kong, Chongqing, and many other cities. These social disruptors have organized mass boycotts of all that kind of music. Radio stations that play it see their disc jockeys harassed on the street by ruffians. Record stores selling it are vandalized. Magazines are praised. That praise it are stolen from the newsstands, and people who make it a great show to, to their neighbors of throwing their collections into the trash. In America and found in case, hundreds of people in Hangzhou piled high of records by Kyoto Nagai, Hideo Murata, Hachiro Kasuga, and other Ryukua uh, singers in the middle of a baseball diamond, which what they then they doused with gasoline and lit on fire. When the fire brigades came to put out the com conflagration, all the arsonists had long fled, leaving nothing but a giant smoking lump of plastic and scorched grass. Needless to say, this has caused quite a row in both Nanjing and Shanghai. The Japanese diplomats have been blowing these silly demonstrations out of proportion, with threats like encouraging cultural warfare and inciting rebellion being thrown around with disturbing frequency. Although our men have desperately promised that they will do something about it, what exactly are we supposed to do about it? Go to door-to-door -door and put a Q Sakamoto album in every house? Why can't they just enjoy what's on the radio? I'm more worried about the debt right now, and the interest rate on the debt. But maybe that's just me. So now we're going to do Japanese brain drain for this one. Oh boy. Our efforts to expel the Japanese are working, but maybe a little bit too much. As an unintended side effect, Japanese intellectuals have left our universities. Japanese students have also drafted plans to finish their education in their homeland. Well, this isn't exactly what we wanted. The f this frees up space in our universities for Chinese students. So, we'll see what happens. An interview with the Economist Part 3. You see, what was nearly as damaging as the original pull out of investors was the sanctions Japan put on China but immediately following it. Native Chinese industries being formed needed as much support and much money as it could get. The Japanese cut off half of all Chinese exports for some time and the entire economy was ground to a halt. The universities lost funding from the government, and I was screwed over as well. The only thing stopping the entire economy from irreversibly collapsing were the subsidies from Gao that replaced some of the losses incurred by the Japanese pulling out. If it weren't for him, we'd, also be, we'd all be living in farmland now. Bless the idiot. And thorough reforms. China's a broken nation. China's been broken for centuries, yet we've pulled ourselves together despite all odds. We've entered one of the most longest periods of division in our long, tumultuous history. And we must make real structural change if we want to return to glory. We must cut out corruption, revitalize the economy, and build a new China from the ashes of old. Now Jing follow, huh? Now we'll see what happens. Now, you never know. Like, as you go further and further into TNO, you can see start seeing some of the things come apart, and it gets slightly more buggier and stuff like that, but... Ah, interview with the cafe owner continued. Cool. Much you never know. Maybe China's really nice and already completely finished. So, after the mob went to sleep for the night and the police had broken up the night owls, there was now that big, massive issue I had nearly forgotten about. The fire had gone out, but half of the building was burnt down. Worse, I received a number of anonymous calls threatening to kill me. How they continued to ignore the fact that I was quite clearly born and raised in China still blows my mind to this day. I got my shotgun, hid in my room above the place, and managed to shiver asleep. I woke to a sharp knocking at my door, I got out of my bed, and I remember this as if it was yesterday. I had my eyes on the shotgun leaning against the wall in the corner and opened the door. Sure, it was the last time I was going to wake up. You're not going to believe this, and that's fine with me. It was a gosh darn Japanese detective, and a perhaps the first instance of the Japanese ever doing something good for this country he was here to help. I moved to a little hotel to escape, you know, constant death threats. A few police officers went over to watch the shop in the days I was away. A few angry guys tried to loot the place, but once they saw the guns, they, started, they walked away. In about a month, there was a community effort to clean up the place. Uh, clean up the place. 
Heck, I even saw a few of the original Vandals there. I kicked them out. All right, after that, um, we need walking the tightrope. So actually, really, throw a form would be good. Yeah, it would be cool to do the best of both worlds and see what that one's like. Yeah. We'll see what, what this one does, because we have no idea. But, if that's the final one, then we'll probably be two... Rocketry? Better computers? Yeah, we'll do better computers. We have the resources and technical knowledge to undertake the second revision of our standard computing systems. Moving away from the previous methods of specialization, we can create standardized systems with consistent modular parts. This would allow just a few models to adequately perform in almost every environment and task, which is pretty good. Nice. And... It's not 72 yet. Uh, social forces, why not? Because we can. I'm using a lowly bureaucrat. He gets off his shift later than most. <clears throat> and when he leaves the gargantuan office, he is almost too tired to kiss his wife goodnight. I didn't have high expectations in Gower, the government, when the crisis broke out. In all honesty, I thought they would just take the Japanese money and shut up. Instead, they did ex the exact opposite. The right move concerning what was in those pa papers. Immediately after the papers leaked, they began arresting the worst offenders and deporting them, kicking out the rest and sending them back to Japan. I have to say I'm impressed. Those papers really had more than a short-term effect on me, especially considering I'm the one who discovered them. He laughs as if he's already said this before. Oh, you haven't realized? I'm Zong Yuhan. Cool. Now, that did lower the interest rate by 4%, but... Oh, baby, that's still not good. Still not good. I think for now, let's keep at least one working on infrastructure, but we still have a lot of factories we could produce. Nice. But let's get this, these ones done first, because they're already kind of part way there. Nice, nice, nice. So, yeah, I'd like it. Maybe, maybe we'll try out sometime to... Ooh, that's so... Ooh, now, okay, now we're getting points for every single day. That's not too bad. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Political mess. That's still really, really bad. Wow. But after that one, we got still got to modernize, so... Ooh, this one? Or the walkie-talkie. The age of the runner is well and truly over. With the deployment of the walkie-talkie, a short-range handheld radio, on-site rapid communication will change forever. From supervisors directly coordinating their staff to engineers diagnosing and explaining problems in real time, nearly all levels of industrial management will benefit. The JJ Mark III. The Japanese have long held the title of greatest computer designer in the world, consistently developing groundbreaking new technologies, increasing the performance and versatility of computers, and setting the standard all other nations, including China, to aspire to reach. This will soon change. The JJ Mark III has been designed to surpass all currently available computers in everything from storage space to processing speed to graphic display. However, it's not the computer's inner workings that are most inventive, but it's its user-friendly design. The computer replaces the previous interface method of typing commands with a visual display that utilizes a new hand-operated pointed device, referred to colloquially by the team as a roller, in reference to the wheel and the device used to scroll up and down on the computer's display. This design is much more intuitive than the Japanese computers, and even those who have never operated computers before can achieve a basic understanding in mere minutes. While it is inevitable that this design will be quickly copied around the world, as many designs have before it, for the first time China will be the first one copied, or being copied. Now that we've escaped the past, we shall decide the future. And we'll go with secure lines, encryption, I definitely want to get down there. Japanese withdrawal, the future is now, I want to get to decryption machines. I'll do technological research a little bit later. Using the power of our newly adapted computer designs, we can greatly enhance our domestic and international intelligence. Computerized decryption systems, utilizing networks of machines dedicated to frequency analysis and pattern matching, can allow us to intercept messages from hostile groups and take preliminary uh, measures. Which would be good. We get more innovation, but we don't need that anymore. Well, let's keep on going, because the debt isn't too bad. It's only almost roughly double our GDP, but whatever. We don't need to talk about that here. We could clamp down on corruption, but at this point... It doesn't really matter too much because we're starting to run out of factories to build. Eh, we could do it. Uh, as that, anyways. Why not? There you go. Get some Marines. I don't want her to PP gain because we could you still use her PP for really good stuff here. Oh, and we can do some other stuff too? Nice. Yeah, because we can do stuff here. We can do stuff here. So, yeah, I'll keep doing archaeological stuff, but whatever. The AFRGC report 85. 990370 is reviewed. Yesterday, a report landed on the desk of the Deputy Chief of the Chinese National Army describing a new invention that could be of the use of the military. An Army engineer in the 8th Division, after tinkering with an old American portable radio, has restored it to working order and even manufactured several others based off of this design. While portable radios have existed in the Army for some time, this, 
they've universally been extensive, ex extremely cumbersome, difficult to use, and unreliable even in ideal conditions. This new walkie-talkie, as it's being called, is barely larger than a telephone handset, wireless, and works well with over long distances and, incle and inclement weather. Our journals are practically salivating at the thought of mass-producing these radios and distributing them amongst the ranks and file, and multiple companies are already buying for production contract. The walkie-talkie is a pinnacle of our exp experimentation and radio technology, representing a level of mastery even the Japanese have yet to achieve. We will achieve a whole new level of military coordination and secure lines after this one. Now let's do maximize efficiency. Every factory will contain a computerized data processing division and maintain constant contact with central management via secure te telephone lines. Research will be planned based on need demonstrated by the factory statistics collected and transmitted at the end of each day. In the name of efficiency, everything that can be controlled will be. Nice. I still want to cut down the debt now, so. That'll be good. And we're 20 days for that. How are we doing down here? Not as well as we'd like, but that's okay. 3.75, 1. 1.5, 1.75. Uh, 1. Uh, that's not too bad. Equipment's going up. X is going up quite a bit, which is really good as well. All right. Shangxi has always been an area of interest for mineral extracting companies in China, and the area's large reserves of coal give them good reason too. Would be wise to tap into the resources <clears throat> uh, to power our nation and heat our homes. Uh, sure, why not? Year two report: the second uh, annual literacy re census reveals that thanks to aggressive education programs targeting the poor and working classes, literacy has significantly increased throughout all of China from about 10% to somewhere exceeding 50%. To the average person, a whole world of learning and culture previously hidden behind arcane sigils has been revealed. For the first time in Chinese history, one can see citizens from all economic backgrounds reading newspapers, deliberating or deliberating over street ads, and immortalizing their ideas, thoughts, and beliefs in ink for others to read. In a similar fashion, China as a whole has torn off the veil of ignorance and strides bravely into new age. Astounding, simply astounding. We're gonna still keep doing that too. Keep cutting out of that debt for now. The warehouse of Baoding Luing Dai Incorporated. All right. Oh, we need this one first. Uh, secure lines them. Given the threat to internal security posed by communications espionage, we must construct a reliably secure lines of communication. Phone lines wrapped through robust and redundant connection networks, combined with more dynamic encryption, should be should afford us the privacy we need. The warehouse of Baoding Luing Dai Incorporated is not listed on any maps of Baoding. An inquiry into the large, inconspicuous building would reveal that it is owned by one son, Penyang, and is being rented by an audio recording tape manufacturer to restore the inventory. This is the furthest a Kampate inspector would go, or likely look, if they became curious for some reason. But if one were to open one of the large crates that fill the warehouses, they would not find unused recording tapes but complex computer parts and strange, almost alien machines. If one were to descend the concealed stairway into the night watchman's office, they would discover the hidden laboratory where the machines designed to crack Japan's most elaborate codes are being built. This is why the warehouse of Baoding Luin, Luyin Dai Incorporated has far more guards than one might expect, and why a barbed wire fence was recently installed around the warehouse, and why the guards, despite being members of a private security firm on paper, are armed with the latest military technology in China. While the Japanese may approve of modernizing our agriculture and industry, they would never approve of something like this. Of course, we stopped asking for their approval long ago. None of their secrets, of course, will be safe, which is exactly what we want. $75 billion, barely going up, and this one is going to get his... Ooh, that's not very good. Hey, please don't hurt us. Please don't hurt us. Oil crisis, please. The oil crisis shouldn't hurt us, right? Please? Oh, I barely did. We went from 2.3 or 2 to 2.3 to 1.9. Oil crisis shocks China. The increased... Increasing destabilization of the Middle East in recent years has finally boiled over. Wars engulfed many of the nations of the Arab world, and as to be expected, the Western imperialists circle around the competitors like vultures, making puppets of the Arabs' leaders and abusing the war and strive to enrich themselves and further their own political interests. It's a sick and demented state of affairs, far too similar to the abuse that Europe and America inflicted upon her own nation before the revolution, yet it is a war in which we have no material stake and stand to gain nothing. We do not stand to lose. We do stand to lose something, though. Access to Arab oil. East Asia is no less dependent on petroleum originating from the Middle East than is the rest of the world, and our public is no exception. Many of the factories and trucks of the Chinese economy run on Middle Eastern crude, and the loss of this precious commodity is sure to wreak havoc on our fragile developing economy. We shall have to make several accommodations in the short term to deal with the initial effects of the oil crisis, and lengthier efforts will be required to resolve our dependence on Arab crude entirely. The imperialists sabotage our economy yet again. Probably don't get new focus tree yet. Oh, we do get a new focus tree. God dang it. Are you kidding me, man? Ah! I want to keep going down that way. Wow, this is this is much more in depth than I thought it would be, so. 
The oil crisis. As China has risen once more to its rightful place of respect before the other powers in the world, its challenges have likewise risen in danger and scale. This is only natural. Strength invites envy, invi envy invites and enemies, and those enemies shall stop at nothing to bring the Miedo Kingdom back to its knees. This time, the challenge is the same one faced by many other nations of the world. What is rapidly becoming known as the oil crisis, as a destructive violence tearing through the Middle East uh, uh, upends the global supply of precious black gold. This international emergency is especially detrimental for China thanks to our newly constructed and resource thirsty factories and infrastructure. Already, the vultures struggle to take advantage of our momentary weakness. It is only by steadfastness and ingenuity that we can rise to the challenge as we have many times before and exit the crisis stronger than we enter it. We lose a hundred more political power. God dang it. And in that exploration, limit oil usage. Oh, I don't want to lose consumer goods. Oh, actually, I don't want to lose political power. I don't want to getting... We're still looking not too bad there. I'll be honest, that's not too bad. Odd even price... Oh, we lose even more political power. We can't afford to lose any more political power, I'll be honest. Hmm... In the exploration first. If the Middle East will not offer us our bounty, we shall have to unearth some treasures of our own. China is a large country, and blessings of geography very often come with the blessings of resources. Oil and gas exploration was hardly a priority for us in the past, but now it has suddenly become one. Using our accumulating technological prowess, we shall assemble Asia's best geologists and surveyors to scour the inland of China in search of new potential deposits of oil to develop and exploit. Give me worse. Well, wow, we're down to... Oh, Jesus Christ, minus 2.8 billion... Man, the game, it is not easy being Chinese. But we still have the political mess. Uh, it's not very good. Look at that. Jesus Christ. Oh, boy. Alright. And build new oil fineries. I mean, I don't want to lose pickle power because we already have two and then some still building, which is still, on my mind, pretty darn good. That's pretty darn good. So build new oil factories, or fields. The time has come to take the first real step in addressing the oil crisis. Our rush efforts at unearthing new oil deposits have been met with modest success, sufficient enough to begin construction of the first experimental wells in the inland provinces. The future successes of the five modernizations and perhaps the future strength and vitality of our very country might as well rest on the godly providence that our gentle hills of our backyard just happen to hold these res resources that we need the most. God dang it, this sucks. Uh, just keep building up civvies, though. Minus 2.8 billion, huh? Eh, it could be worse, I suppose. Oop, Marines 2. Cool. Mountaineers, that would be very good for China. Um, we need a lot of money for this. I and mean, all is not well, so we can't even do that. So you might as well just try to cut down the deck, because it's probably still going to keep going up, so. And then exploration. And then maintenance companies. All right. Field hospitals, yay. And then, petroleum and hanging on? Yeah, why not? Why shouldn't the birthplace of a proud and ancient civilization also be the birthplace of the solution to the energy crisis? Perhaps the Jia and Sheng of millennia past took Hainan for their home for a reason, a divine, prophetic act, informing our present generation of the wealth hidden in the central plains of China. Or perhaps it's a coincidence. Either way, we shall extract every last drop of crude that we can from the banks of the Yellow River. However much or however little we are able to gather, this oldest province of China shall play its part in ushering in the newest and proudest age for the Middle Kingdom. Which we do get more political power and stability, so... Because this looks really bad. We get minus 25% consumer goods. Or political power. Oh, it's so bad. We can still clamp down on corruption, but we would literally be losing political power every single day. Which is just... Mm, big sadness hurting me in internally. But we're still cutting down the debt. Yay. <laughs> oh, China's a mess. The ennui fields. A few scattered deposits has been noticed by our team of surveyors and ennui. It's incumbent upon us to exploit them with expedience, sadly. It is hardly looking as though we have anything comparable to the great oil fields of Arabia with which to make to sustain our economic development. Making do with what we have is better than nothing, but it's still not adequate. This will not be the end of the crisis. So basically we got plus 10% more political power. So when we come over here, that kind of offsets it a little bit. Better, oh, better extraction methods. That's not bad. Oil for industries? I like that one. We need more oil. Yeah, we'll definitely need to do that one. We're going to keep spending just because we need that political power still, so. Hey, minus 4.75 billion. That's better than where we're at, so. And we're still building up civvies, so. Could be worse. It actually could be a lot, lot, lot worse. We're only gaining political power because we're spending more uh, on civilian spending. That's it. That's literally it. Hey, but we're doing okay on fuel now. Better extraction methods. We do not have the same abundance of oil as some other countries might, so we must make the best of what little we do have locked away beneath the earth. Efficiency must do her part in defeating scarcity. Our engineers will be set to the task of finding out new and better ways to extract oil and natural gas from beneath the ground. More fuel gate per oil, which is good, and more synthetic oil, not bad. 
Even though we're we're doing quite well. I would say we're doing quite well. Keep cutting down that debt. It's going to take a long time to do so, but it'll have to be what it'll have to be. Oh, the oil crisis. And we still have a small army, which really does suck. Actually, can we build civvies in our allies? No, we cannot. Oh, look at that. We still build up here, too. Nice. Here you go. Do that. All right. And then we'll, I guess we have to limit oil usage. Gosh darn it. <sighs> the most obvious and immediate necessary response to a lack of oil is to use less oil. Sadly, this is anything but harmless to execute. Our nascent industrial base is dependent on a steady supply of petroleum, and we cannot afford to abandon industrialization and its role in the formation of a new modernized China. My apologies. Let me go ahead and do this one real quick. We have to pick and choose which critical resources will receive how much of what they need from our steady dwindling supply. And none of our options are good ones. It'll be a political, politically costly burden to bear, waiting our support among the people, and especially among those industrialists left with the short end of the stick. Sadly, it does not look as though we will be able to consider ending the rationing until the crisis is thoroughly resolved, and China's hunger for oil is finally quenched. Well, I'll be honest, we're doing okay. We're really not doing okay. We're actually filling our oil reserves right now, so... I don't know who's creating this scare... This, this fear mongering, but they should be held accountable for you know what they're doing. Keep cutting that down, baby. We're doing an okay job, and we'll have to do price controls. Unfortunately, we need to make the most effective use of all the oil we can get our hands on, and that means controlling the domestic market both in production and in consumption. We should discourage any consumption of this most precious commodity that is not economically necessary. And the best way to discourage consumption is to make a product lucratively expensive. Industry will be able to bear the cost to keep itself running. Hopefully, the populace will not. A small price to pay in the long term. What is the inability for the urban workers to drive themselves around for a while compared to the economic strength of our country? We get more fuel, but we lose stability, which is not very good. At this point, I don't think research really matters too much. I'm not really sure if we'll go into any more wars, so... Hey, minus 6.8 billion. That's actually better. Great. It's getting better for us, though. So. I mean, yeah, the GDP growth took quite a hit, but things happen, you know. And we're halfway to getting 15 to 50%. Not bad. Or 15 to 25%. Nice. Hope you guys are having a pretty good day. I, I'm a little more surprised that China has this much content. That's great. Of course, China is a pretty major power, or should be eventually. Given the depth of supply gut of oil we have on our laps, it's necessary for us to take some creative and unorthodox approaches to rationing. To make our conser conservation of oil for civilian light industry is both thorough and fair, we should restrict purchase of gasoline to 50% of the population per day. Vehicles with license plates ending in even numbers should be permitted to purchase gasoline on even days of the month, and vehicles with odd numbered license plates on odd days. Hopefully, these measures will have the effect of both restricting consumption overall, as well as cutting back on wasteful practices like panic buying and daily trips to the pump for small up to up ups. The burden of this crisis shall be shared as equitably as is reasonable. We lose even more PP. Oh, it's so bad. But actually, we civilian proportion GDP cost goes down by 2%. Not bad. Is that a, it looks almost like a stormtrooper, but it's just someone working, I think. On the last place, number two. Man. We just cannot catch a break. But our oil reserves are not doing too bad. We have four full lines of factories running still. And we're at plus some. So, really... Not that bad. Really not that bad. I wish we could edit our divisions, though. But it is what it is. And so, we still have insubordination in the army. That's so bad. Eh, oil for the industries next would be good for us, too, though. Keep boosting up, because if we don't do that, we'd, we'd lose a lot of PP. Odd, even policy. Followed up with oil for the industries. Some activities requiring oil consumption are simply more important than others. Civilian ease of travel is practically useless lux luxury, whereas keeping factories running and transportation of bulk goods is the lifeblood of the modern economy. It, only, it is the only sane and reasonable for us to give us heavy preference to heavy industry for the duration of the oil crisis, which we get way more construction speed, which would be very good. Annual GDP growth factor goes up by 10%, which is also very good as well, so not too bad. It looks like we're coming out of this pretty quickly, so... No real complaints for me. This could be a lot, a lot worse. Man, I always forget about the oil crisis when I play as America, but I guess we can't core this area too, huh? Is this minus three? Well, that kind of sucks. Keep building, 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 building. Oil for the industries. Nice. And followed up with, we need more oil. There's still simply not enough oil to go around and keep the factories churning and the trucks rolling. The measures we've taken so far have not exactly been useless, but they also haven't been nearly enough to end this emergency we find ourselves in. The crisis needs to be resolved, and soon. Oh, there goes Iran. Oh god, they're blowing up too. If we truly want to make our great country of China energy self-sufficient, 
We need to do more as a nation than merely drill a few wells. Forceful and vigorous investments must be made into both production and the technology for even more future production. All the best minds of the country must be put together, or else all of our efforts at modernization will be for naught. If we fail, we may risk China's thirst for oil spiraling into outright dehydration. Oh. Oh, this is the focus will eventually be completed. Offshore drilling. Offshore drilling. Um, I like that a lot. More consumer speed and less consumer goods factories. Construction speed, I should say. More political power and daily gain. Ask for permission, Shanghai Coastal Fields. Um, or Synthetic Dawn. That sounds really cool to me. Honestly, with the way we chose, and we were trying to avoid Japanese, like, contact and stuff. And we have already expelled the businessmen and such, too. Oh, look! It went up by 0.3%. That could be a lot worse. Could be a lot, lot worse. Helicopters. Chinese aviation. Um, synthetic Dawn. We'll probably go Synthetic Dawn. Just because that probably sounds like the way we want to go. It doesn't look like it help us out too much. Yeah, this doesn't look very good. <laughs> but we went to the far right side of the tree earlier, so... We'll probably just... Because if we go to war with them, then the Japanese can just destroy those offshore, you know... Oil drilling rigs, so we probably go synthetic dumb. Just as it was, the Chinese people themselves that facilitated the country's national liberation from the imperialists of the past. It'll be Chinese technology itself that facilitates our national liberation from the resource crisis of the present. Our advances towards modernization can help us see the light at the end of the tunnel in the oil crisis and allow us to fix this problem without simply finding more oil deposits to exploit. Instead, we should make our own oil. And my apologies once again, let's do this real quick. Our reliance on foreign petroleum and on conventional petroleum deposits in the first place must come to an end. It is time for new dawn in the Chinese energy industry. The dawn of synthetics. The future of China will be a future of massive refineries using modern technology and scientific expertise to turn the resources our nation does possess in abundance into those very resources we demand the most. It shall be an undertaking of immense mechanical scale, and one which will transform China forever as more as we enter into a new age. And it looks like Russia is killing itself once again. Go out looking or make our own. Even as we've made our best efforts to solve the oil crisis plaguing China, a final solution, ooh, still eludes us. It's time to make an important decision as to how we can deliver this problem, the swiftest and most certain end, to restore the national economy to full capacity and re-enable re China's modernization. A fork in the low road awaits us, and we must make a faithful choice about the future of our country. Should we solve the oil crisis by going out and looking for more oil, pursuing drilling of deposits offshore, beyond the coast, or shall we resolve the crisis through more mechanical means, the synthetic production of oil through liquefaction of our coal reserves? We gotta go this way. Find the experts. The heck fire pace of modernization we've endured these past few years have greatly bolstered the scientific community of our country. New capital and new facilities for technological advancement have sprung up all over the land, and various economic sectors and it shall take the labor of the best of them to all to solve the oil crisis. We shall focus as a nation on assembling the best and brightest of all of China into a crack emergency response team, which will enable us to uh, make great strides forwards in the petrol chemical industry and to assemble a plan for how to move forward in our efforts of synthesizing oil en masse. Great. And what method? Our scientists have conceived two proposals for how to advance our petrochemical industry concerning two related chemical processes, called liquefaction and the German-conceived Fischer-Tropsch process. Both proposals concern the basic idea of turning abundant Chinese coal deposits into usable oil products, but the processes differ slightly in how the coal is refined and in what products can be most easily produced. We shall have to carefully analyze the report put forward by our scientists and choose our best path best suited to our government. And we can do this one, huh? We need to do both. Oh, we need to do both of these to do this one. Huh. That's interesting. It says we have to do either or. Not bad. Oh, we're actually losing political power now. Oh, that's not really good. Oh, boy. Ugly. Oh, man. Hopefully we get some more political power because it's not doing too well for us. But what method? Oh, boy. End rationing, huh? Well, who needed pee pee, right? It's only going to get worse from here on out. But, let's start the experiments. Now that we've chosen our path, it's time to travel down it. The first step will be testing the proposals we selected, seeing if it works on a smaller scale for our purposes, then scaling it back up to a nationwide endeavor. If there's any nasty surprises in store for our plans of mass synthesization of oil, we'll find out about them and thoroughly sort them out before we move on to full implementation. Keep spending. Year 3 report. The third annual literacy census reports that not only has the literacy rate continued to steadily rise, but there's also been a sharp increase in the number of domestic literary publications. Once average citizens now imbued with the power of written words have taken it upon themselves to author books about nearly anything and everything. Although these new classics are understandably not as of yet comparable to Japanese or Western literature, 
They have become incredibly popular within China and some have even attained foreign recognition and international renown. A notable example is Orange Rain, an adventure novel written by a rural gardener concerning a man and his monkey journey to the edge of the world which is swept like a firestorm through Peruvian literacy circles. It appears that the literacy of programs, an idea founded upon a dream of a dream, has widely been successful beyond even the most optimistic expectations. We've gone further than we could have ever hoped. Oh, and we've got some of that stuff. Research really doesn't matter at this point, like I think I said before. Better tanks, better tanks, yes please. Well, even though we have no PP, at least the GDP could be a lot worse. What method? Can we please get out of this political mess a little bit more? Just a little bit more. Education status is really good. Uh, how's the faction effects doing? There's no effects. Okay. Well, I guess I'm glad we're not clamping down to corruption yet. It would have been really bad for us if we were trying to do that right now. Oh, baby. What methods? And start the experiments. And Iran has decided to kill itself as well. The price tag. Any great undertaking by government is sure to be a dearly expensive, but the price tag for our scientists' preferred synthetic oil initiative has been a scourgingly high number of zeros. The Germans' Fischer Tropisch a uh, process is the best available for synthetically refining oil and our own petro petrochemical engineers are understandably refining oil and their own petro uh, uh, eager for China to possess a petrochemical industry comparable to that of the great juggernaut of the world. They are so enthusiastic even that their plan to emulate Germany was apparently conceived without any thought as to how to prohibitively expensive it would be to actually implement. Row after row of new synthetic oil refiners using this most up-to-date expensive equipment does not come cheap. We will have plenty of oil under the best quality possible to be sure, but what good will it be if we can scarcely afford any trucks or tanks to put the oil into the plan after the plan ravages our pocketbook? In contrast to the second proposal, a focus on order, direct coal, liquefaction techniques, will be much easier undertaking for a government requiring only the re-outfitting of existing facilities already used for refining conventional crude. It will hopefully still be enough for, to end the oil crisis, but will perhaps leave us with less room to grow to, going into the future and fall short of the promise of full energy independence. On the upside, we won't go broke if we pick it. No matter the cost, let's go no matter what. New financial experiments here. We we'll probably have a massive deficit going on, but hey, been build synthetic refineries. The plans are made, the experiments are concluded, and now it's time for the largest chemical industry project in Chinese history. Even ignoring the sensitivity of construction of something like a synthetic oil refinery, the banal aspects of this phase, building so many buildings of such size and so many accommodating infrastructure, will be a trial in its own right, especially with our own industrial might weakened as it is by the very oil crisis we're attempting to resolve. This will be quite the lengthy undertaking. We'll get two synthetic refineries, which is nice, but... Do we ever get to do this one? Because it says this requires both. Requires, okay, so this is a little bug in the game then. It requires one of the following. But it requires one of the following. We cancel the requirements are not met. Synthetic fuel. Okay, so maybe we can Okay, maybe we can do that one. If you wonder about this, please go ahead. We can do this one actually after we complete this one. That's kind of cool. Okay, maybe it's not a bug. Maybe it just... Yeah, that makes sense then. Okay, that makes sense. My bad. Sometimes it, you just never know what will happen. All right, synthetic fuel. Finally, the moment of truth is at hand. After so many laborious months of planning, testing, and constructing, we can reap the rewards of our heroic determination. The first shipments of synthetically refined oil are on their way to gas stations and factory floors all across China, supplementing the meager conventional oil our consumers have had to fight over the whole duration of the crisis. By cleverest ingenuity and millions of tons of coal, we will deliver the oil crisis its death blow in China. Great, more synthetic oil and synthetic fuel, which is pretty good. Chinese science wins out, hopefully. Hey, minus some billion, not bad. Oh, excuse me. Oh man. And Iran has defeated Iran. Good job, Iran. And ew, they kill themselves again. Great. Signal companies, very nice, very nice, very nice. Um let's come over to helicopters and start thinking about these guys. Air assaults? Even more air assaults? Nice, nice, nice. Synthetic fuel. And then we should be able to do the middle one now. Expanding the refineries. More crude and requires more refineries to turn it into usable products. Our old refining capacity is no longer sufficient to meet the demands of the new China, and so we must have new refineries as well. We will concentrate on constructing these modern petrochemical sites and locations convenient both to manufacturing and to the oil sector to help meet the demands of both and to grow the sprawling new industrial centers of the modern China. Increases miscellaneous cost, which sucks, but it is what it is. Which we could probably afford. Even during the crisis, we're still cutting down the debt, which is pretty cool. Pretty darn cool. 
And we've got how many days? And the Guzzi Ball. Four days left, that's not too bad. Yeah, I just, at least to me, it doesn't make any sense for us to do offshore when we're really focusing on making China basically uh, very, give them a high level of autarky if possible, at least against Japan, so. All right, next focus is improving Shangli oil production. The Shangli is one of the largest and most industrially important oil deposits in China. Dominating domestic production from the province of Shandong, the Shangli was first taken advantage of long before the oil crisis hit, having initially been developed by enterprising Japanese abattoirs in the 50s. Those bounties were originally mostly for export to China. Consumption patterns have now changed since then, and China itself has the greater need of this precious resource. A threat that Japanese companies dominate uh, throughout the Shangli fields are thankfully happy to profit off of filling. Cool, my apologies for that, and let's do this one real quick, and do that too. As consumption has changed, though, so to have production methods. Development of the Shangli took place before some of our current innovations existed. And now we can go back and refit some of the wells there to allow for faster and deeper drilling. It's incumbent on us to focus on making the very best use of every production facility. We have including those owned and operated by the Japanese and via Fani Massacre. Oh, well, more fuel gain for oil and even more fuel. Great. Very good. At least our PP isn't being hit as bad. It's only minus 0.05. I still like to get PP, but whatever. The worst has passed. Oh, look at this. The oil crisis that once seemed poised to end China's modernization is now only an inconvenience. Our investments are bearing fruit, and the factories and roadways of China are churning and speeding along again mostly. Prices are still higher than they used to be, but we have gone far enough as a country that, that the end is finally on the horizon. In which we get more construction speed, a little bit more, which is nice. Get better consumer goods, which is very, very nice. And more stability, which is... You know, always welcome. Always welcome to get more stability. 196 factories. And we're kind of done building all these factories up. We've kind of... Well, I guess... Well, yeah, literally. We're just building a lot of roads now. So... Hey! There you go. Keep building the factories. we got some really good infrastructure up, up in the north. And in the central part. Ooh, and here's look at that. That's really good. The worst has passed. Great! And end rationing. No longer will we have to pick and choose which factories receive the resources they need to function. No longer will Chinese drivers be arbitrarily restricted from purchasing on certain days or forced to only fill up a quarter of the tank. Our efforts have worked and the availability of oil in China is great enough to make unnecessary any more rations or restrictions. The oil market is back open in China. Rationing is finally over. And you get plus, oh, so good. 25% more political power. Oh, thank God. And stability. Oh, man. At this point, after this, we got to really focus on getting more GDP growth because it's been so bad for quite a while. So, oh my goodness. Happy 1972, everyone. Yeah, China's got definitely 10 full years of content. So that's pretty nice. That's pretty darn good. At least the worst is passed and crisis resolved. Oh, the modifier will be removed completely? Wow, that's, that's not bad. Crisis resolved. The oil crisis is officially over in China. Through ingenuity and force of will, we have managed to overcome the international energy emergency that shook the whole world to its core, and have come out of it stronger, better, more self-reliant. Our industry and infrastructure have returned to full production and full capacity, and we are more than ready ever to fulfill our modernizations and make China strong and proud again. Slowly getting better and better and better. Uh, oil crisis. We still have this god-awful uh, political mess here, but... Uh. Oh, look at this. Synthetic fuel and then oil crisis. Well, minus 35% political power gain. 5% consumer goods factors is a lot better than what it used to be. Construction speed is not too great, but it's better than what it used to be. And personal cost modifiers, well, China is doing what China needs to do to make itself better. Less than $130 billion in national debt, not bad. And rationing. And the crisis resolved. And we'll finish this part with marching on. Now that the oil crisis is in the past, we have no time left to dwell on it. We will take the advantages we have gained for ourselves from our response to the crisis and use them to further our goals elsewhere in strengthening and modernizing a great country. The Chinese people cannot know for sure that they will never face another emergency like this again until the country is fully self-sufficient and fully independent. Good, we'll end all that stuff, which is nice, 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 nice. And do that stuff too, and come over here and see what we need to do. Nice. Very good. Hey, we get we finally get 0.49 political power every single day. That's the oil crisis effects. Hey, stability gives us, wow, plus 31% stability. That's a lot of stability. Is that an oversight? You know what? Maybe we could keep the oil crisis because we're a very stable nation now. Keep spending for now, though, because it helps us build faster, 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 faster. Nice. 
Oh, we lost all that extra stability now. 0.63? Hey, it's gone now. Sort of. Um. Cool. Oh, we still get a lot of synthetic fuel. Oh, we're doing here. 2.2%. Not bad, not bad. No, nothing, nothing else has really changed too much. We're spending a lot on civilian spending, which makes sense. Construction spending is 1.7 billion. Even if we lower that, we won't get that much more money anyway, so... <clears throat> we might have to lower that eventually, but... Meh. Whoa! Wow, look at that! The deficits are really good! Actually, the growth went up by 2.6%. Now we get 1.3. Nice. Now we can actually probably spend a little bit more down here, but we're still dealing with the oil crisis. Uh, it really requires nuclear weaponry. That's not bad. 10%. It's still not very good, but marching onwards, my friends. Temporary brain. Oh, that's good. We got rid of that. And now we can come back and do secure lines. Uh, given the threat to internal uh, security posed by communications espionage, we must construct reliably secure lines of communication. Phone lines wrapped around robust and redundant connection networks combined with more dynamic encryption should offer us the privacy we need, which I already read last earlier, but it's fine, whatever. 0.63 is not bad. And then, then we'll do maximize efficiency. Uh, I think I already read this one, so if you want to read about this one again, please go right ahead. Yeah, yeah. Every factory will contain a computerized data processing division. Yeah, I've read that one, so. Bonus industry, which we might do ahead of time, even though it's 72 and almost approaching 73, which is not bad. GP will receive a small boost. Industrial expertise will rapidly begin to improve. So, pretty good stuff. 0.63 is just not enough every day for my, me and my liking, but that's okay. Any more civvies anywhere, please? Please? One bit more civvies. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, almost roughly seven working at the same time. Yeah, I could stop cutting that down, but whatever. A midnight raid. Three weeks ago, the rare warehouses of Baoding Luen Dai Incorporated was raided by a squad of Ken Pai Tai agents. Oh boy. Looking for contraband. While they found nothing, the warehouse staff were almost caught off guard and evacuated the lab and staff with only hours of spare. We got lucky, but it's clear information is leaking, and we must make sure that we improve our encryption methods before our run looks out. China has no official encryption procedures, and the information security consisted of trusting those with classified info not to talk about it. The process of rewiring our phone and telegraph lines to combat wiretapping and other forms of espionage will be time-consuming, but if we ever want to prevent the Japanese from knowing the contents of every message sent within our government, it was a process we must take to provide an extra layer of security to our communications. Several newspaper word and math puzzle designers have been secretly hired to help us develop a code language that is almost impossible to decipher without a key. Once this language is finished, it will be implemented in all of our classified communications, so that should the Japanese break past our encryption measures, they will find is all they will find is lines of gibberish. Keep it secret, keep it safe, and technological research. I think I've already read this one, so I'm going to read this one again. Please go right ahead. And bingo, bongo, bungo. Cool. I'm just more focused on the debt right now. Not too bad. China's a lot more involved than I thought it would be. At least a little bit more involved. I knew it was going to be involved just because China is China, but... Still. Just still. That's 72, so we must keep doing more gun stuff, right? Nice. I just want to do maximize efficiency. I guess breakthrough in engineering next. With the assistance of modern equipment and renewed research investment, the ground has been laid for a remarkable advancement in our domestic engineering capability. Each day, small armies of students and technicians pour over designs of sturdier, larger, more efficient infrastructure. With a little bit more effort, they will soon be ready for deployment. Project 680 takes off. As the gap between China and the modern world continues to shrink, our research efforts have begun to shift from studying the technology of other countries to developing our new innovations. Morale among our scientists and engineers have increased as they are no longer limited to reverse engineering Japanese products and infrastructure, and are free to pursue their long-held hypotheses at last. Numerous research efforts on everything from handheld radios to modernized radar stations are already underway. One particular project has grabbed the public's attention, and is receiving significant media coverage as it progresses, formerly referred to as Project 680. The DG, DEG medium range ballistic missile will be the first ever Chinese designed missile system, and if testing is successful, it is expected to become a mainstay of our new military arsenal. While we have not received approval from the Japanese, likely because it. <clears throat> The missile will be fully capable of reaching the most populous areas of Japanese home islands. The project is proceeding at an excellent pace, with several prototypes under construction and early testing scheduled before the end of the year. It is better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. Very cool. And we'll see what comes of this. Um, consumer goods. At this point, we don't really need to do that. I mean, yeah, we want to build roads faster, but after we build roads, what else do we have to do? And the Revolutionary Council has united Russia. The Red Army's army last. Very nice. Very, very nice. And I think if I remember correctly, when I played as Veseliski, which apparently just reunited Russia, um, actually that copyrighted strike my video, so that was not very good. But hey, the USSR is back. That's kind of cool, right? The USSR, everyone loves the USSR. Vasilevsky, I don't know how many times I've actually seen him win, which is 
Interesting to see, so yeah. Let's keep going down the deck because we can. Yeah, no debt, please. No debt, please. Yeah, all this stuff. We're gonna need some money, anyways, but. Mm. Corrupt construction begins on the Yangtze Dam. The dam project has never been officially labeled as a project that will mark China's full transition from the past into the present. Officially, it's just another piece of infrastructure, albeit an ambitious one, designed to bring cheap electricity to central China and made possible the continuous advancement of our engineering capabilities. However, almost as soon as the project was announced, it garnered an enormous amount of attention, with the media labeling it as a pinnacle of Chinese engineering and technology. It became an important symbol to our people before the final plans even left the drawing board, a physical manifestation of China's newfound power and ambition today. The president of Chinese government himself appeared at the commencement ceremony and following a short speech about how far China has come in so little time, broke ground on the new project. It'll take over a decade to finish a dam, but is already empowering the Chinese people. Even the mighty Yangtze must bow to modern China and maximize, finally, efficiency. My apologies for reading fast and just slowing over my speech. It's just, I naturally read things very, very fast in my mind. Just incredibly fast. Usually. Doesn't mean I always understand it, but I usually read it pretty fast. Oh, this one. Consumer goods. Eh, that's okay. I want more GDP growth. That's not bad to do, yeah. The 51 invest in private businesses. Wasn't there one over here too? Domestic consumption. Yeah, increases GDP growth by 0.3%. That's not too bad. We actually might take that one. Since we're, we're literally running out of things to build now. Or we'll cut down on, on construction costs. Actually, that might be better to do. There you go. Cool. And then, the Japanese withdrawal. Sure, why not? Oh, I'll ask you the features now. Finally, we approach the final stages of our technical modernization effort. We have acquired all the resources, means, methodologies, and knowledge required to pull China fully into the modern era. <clears throat> all that remains is to secure the willpower of our people, to ensure the smooth adaptation of civil society to the new reality. <clears throat> It's just good business. As the competition between Chinese and Japanese products grows more intense by the day, our manufacturing sector is taking every possible step to maximize efficiency. The factories run day and night, with workers constantly filtering in and out of their shifts, start and end. Copying the methods of the Zaibatsu, some companies have begun implementing extensive vertical integration. The workers live in company housing. They listen to company radios and eat company meals, wear company clothes, and their children go to company schools. Sometimes to defeat a monster, one must become a monster, and there's no economy on Earth more monstrous than the Japanese. The results of these steps are already evident. While a Chinese and Japanese computer may be of roughly equal quality, 10 computers roll off of our assembly lines for every one that they produce. The Japanese exploitation of our markets is coming to an end, and at the current rate of progress, it'll not be unreasonable to assume that before the decade's end, it'll be Chinese, rather than Japanese products that are filling Asia's markets. Flood the markets, let's see how they like it. Nice. Very, very nice. Actually, if that's the case, I might lower spending right here now. Hmm... It doesn't help us that much. Yeah, there's no point in doing that one. Because it, it costs 25 political power to do that. But, the Japanese withdraw. With all of our advances in technology and design and production, the Japanese technicians we previously invited have become redundant. What they previously taught us is now common knowledge in our engineering firms and in academies. They have doubtlessly recognized this as well and will soon return to Japan. The cost of keeping the Japanese technicians will be reduced, which is great, and get more research speed too. The Japanese file, Jap Japano file, faction won't like this, but oh well. The Center of Progress and Innovation. A farmer in Shandong pushes a button and chemically purified water pours out of glistening steel pipes into his cattle watering station. A woman strolls home through the neon streets of Nanjing. As she reaches her apartment, she turns on her TV to catch the evening news. The people of China work with the finest tools in the world. Telephone lines and radio broadcasts reach all to all corners of our nation, connecting our people and uniting all of China in a common purpose. Throughout Asia, Chinese products are sought after for the high quality and the Chinese technical experts are regarded as some of the highest in their fields. To describe the change the Chinese society has undergone in the past few years as monumental would be an understatement. Not even the Japanese modernization of a century ago can compare to the speed with which we have lifted ourselves from the dark ages and pushed our way to the front of the global technological race. The five modernizations are not complete, but we now have the technology needed to reach our full potential, and all of it is designed to produce right here in China. The future is, of course, Ours, which is good, 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 good. We can invite them in, but well, whatever. And then showing ourselves to the world. With our technology modernization complete, we will still launch ourselves back into the spot on the world stage that we've been denied for so long. Back before the Japanese occupation, before the century of humiliation, there was a time when the whole world feared Chinese might and metal. Now, that time is coming again. We get another research slot. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. The effects of the slave of the samurai national spirit will be significantly reduced. Very, very good. Look at all that. We can even cut down even further. Um, we could cut down, but we have 50 now. Clamp down on corruption. That'd be okay. I want to increase more of this stuff here. 
We get more GDP growth. Actually, at this point, we could probably do this. Yeah. Now, they like us a little bit more, which is good. They don't like us nearly as much, but that's okay. We don't really care. 74? Uh, let's trucks. Oh, uh, let's do this one first. Departure from uh, the Saigo no Waker. What care? Huh. <clears throat> Today, the Saigo no Waker departed from Yokai Harbor. Aboard it is Ashahi, Asahi Suzuki, an electrical engineer who has spent the last four years working to help China, China modernize for Ash, Asahi. It's a better sweet feeling to watch the Chinese coast recede into the horizon. When he came to China, it was a backwards land, barely more than a massive rice field for Japan. He and his colleagues were instrumental into building into the modern colossus that they're leaving behind, and he's rightly proud of the work. On the other hand, the last few months he had made it clear that he was no longer needed. While his classrooms and laboratories had once been filled with wide-eyed students eager to learn, the Chinese no longer needed lessons from a foreign instructor. There were plenty of Chinese teachers who knew just as much as him, as much as it hurt to admit. Many of the finest technicians, engineers, scientists, and architects in all of Asia finally returning home after years abroad. While the contribution to the five modernizations will never be forgotten, the time has come for China to shed itself other way and assert its full technological independence. Sayonara Asahi, Sayonara Japan. Ah, very cool. And then the conference. Oh boy. China is a nation reborn. Our students are the world's envy. Our economy is thriving. Our technology is rapidly catching up to modern standards still. Our army lies broken and poorly trained. The flame of Chinese liberation smolders in the winds. Gao will call a conference of every leading administrator to decide China's true path going forward. And the long and winding road to freedom. Only through adversity can the Middle Kingdom emerge brighter than ever. Cool. Go and grab that stuff. That doesn't matter to us too much. <clears throat> eh, we're already... Yeah, let's cut it down. Why not? We're at 85 billion for GDP. Not too bad. Not too bad. Not too bad. Actually, what do we have for this? 10%. 3.4%? Not too bad, but the debt is still very, very high. The interest rates are, at least. Uh, we could clamp down on corruption, but, meh. 26% influence, 47%, 58%. That's very good. The dragon bears its fangs. The first Chinese technological presentation and exposition has commenced, and while it's close, closed to the public, foreign press agents from all across the world are in attendance, covering the multitude of wonders on display. The ex exhibits display new Chinese innovations in every scientific field from cellular biology to arithmetic computing to experimental psychology. The focus on this year's conference is China's military advances, and with new vehicles and equipment taking the spotlight. Among the items showcased are the Tianlong 105, China's domestic civilian aircraft, and the Mark III infrared rifle scope, colloquially referred to as a night sight scope, which allows infantrymen to engage in low-light combat with much greater accuracy. Some of inner general staff are concerned that showing casing too much experimental military hardware may be compromising our secrecy, but the fact that is that we're only revealing the tip of the iceberg. The exposition has caused quite the international stir, with the reactions ranging from supportive to apprehensive, especially from the Japanese reporters coming covering the event. Once more, the world fears China's might. Let's go and start doing this stuff. That's fine with us. I've never actually researched all this stuff before. Uh, that's actually really cool. Five research slots. When have I ever played a campaign when we have five research slots? That's so good. So good. Hey, 62% now. That's nice. Uh, this would be... Oh, actually. Oh, that's a little different. We lose 0.25 political power. Um, hmm. Decrease their opinion, but it doesn't increase their influence at all. We don't really need to do this one anymore either, so... Um, we get military factories uh, c towards construction. That's not bad, but, man, If we don't do that so many more, how much money do we get? Eh, that's okay. Let's get some more PP then. Keep cutting down that debt. And I want to see what happens with the conference. China must unite against the greatest foe. Do we, like, absorb everyone else? That'd be really cool. Uh, we couldn't get up to... Oh, we're relatively close to getting the next level of poverty done, but, ah, uh, whatever. It's fine. Come on. The conference. The conference for a minute enter. These nudging conference rooms had played host to countless low-level bureaucrats, those from insignificant backgrounds, with no hope of climbing any administrative ladder. The women in the ethnic minorities, poor men without the networks necessary to climb a brutal system, all had walked into the room with a certain hopelessness that was distinctly Chinese. They gave presentations on new ambulances in Pukuo district or on the construction of new residences in Chuzhou. Usually the viewers of the presentation were unimpressed, some voted no on whatever project was being presented. Some voted yes, though. It hardly mattered, nor did they care much. What did it matter? Today, however, was different. The four true giants walked into the conference room. A wee... A, br a wheeze. A breeze whistled through the solitary window. Gao Zong Wu shivered. Today was everything. It was a day that China's future would be laid bare, decided by men that were all too human. Men with uncertain loyalties and even more uncertain motives. The four men gathered, sitting around the table. Gao had planned for an extravagant event. A real conference, maybe something less disastrous than the one Manchukuo had put together a few years ago. 
The war in the south had put that to rest. China needed direction and fast, so Gao called his old friend Zhu Fohai and his new friend Jiang Zemin. Finally, he requested a time with Secretary Chen Gongbo. One of the two options was clear. China would die or would liberate the eastern continent. Now, there was all there was to do was to decide which. Gao took a deep breath and the conference conference domestic policy. The three modernizations transformed China. The sick man of Asia, bereft of dignity after a century of humiliation, turned itself into the breadbasket of a billion men and women. A divided and sickly nation became robust and industrious, ridding itself of corruption. The power of revolutionary change was made clear. However, China is in many ways still a broken nation. Workers still struggle to make ends meet. Pollution had choked the natural beauty of our nation. Perhaps most importantly, the rural folk still live under a semi-feudalistic system of land ownership. Land owners or landlords dominate farms and subject tenants to what is practically slavery. It was Sun Yat-sen's dream to free the peasants of servitude. It is a dream that is withered. The land to the tiller ideal is dead. Squalor is a terrible norm. Gao explained his concerns. As Zhang Guo was to tackle the great issues of her time and became the world power it must be, she would have to evolve, not evolve in just in the matters of education or industry. She would have to build great new monuments to energy and society, reform systems that have been put in place since the birth of China. Chen Gongbo shot back with a steely glare. China needs change. It needs change which is gradual and conducted in cooperation and with neighbors. It could tackle land reform, but slowly and with respect to both landlord and tenant. It could build monuments, but those within reason. It could change politics, but using old methods of money and coercion. Only then could China move forward. Idealism cannot guide idealism. Only pragmatism can guide idealism. March forward with change. Choose restraint in our future planning. We're going to go ra you know, radical here. Military policy. China's military remains weak. Its equipment is designed in Japan and produced in the great arsenals at Hanyang. Soldiers are poorly trained and officers educated in military universities that are shadows of their state in the old Republican era. Even with the reforms spearheaded by members of the legislative Yan and Gao himself, it is no match for the uncertain world. Gao was worse educated on matters of the military than most of the upper crust in China. His bread and butter was economic reform, not the production of ammo and the murder of men. Even with his limited knowledge, he was aware that reform was desperately needed. Zhang Zemin chimed in with his opinion. The old doctrines in Zhang's view were dead. They have been rendered obsolete by weapons that could obliterate cities in a second, machines that roared across the city or the sky at unimaginable speeds. There was no point in clinging to old doctrines in such a brave new world, new theaters of war. New universities must guide China's armies to victory. Chen Gong Bo, for the first time, seemed to consider the words of his arrival. Perhaps they agreed on something for once. Zhu did not. The methods of the past, whether they may be of the 19th century or of Sun Tzu's time, still have true. Technology may not be consistent, but human nature was so. Why should they change the strategy that relied on the failings of man? Was one, it was one pillar of which they could lean on. New theory? Develop a new Chinese military theory in the future? Well, its could be greatly strengthened our forces, only time will tell if our efforts will succeed. The old ways will do just fine. Hmm. New theory. And unity. The illusion of Chinese unity was that an illusion. It had been so for much of history. Revolutions and revolts had rocked the nation for the entirety of history. For much of its history, China was composed of warring states, nothing more than personal fightums engaged in an internal war. Through the millennia, the emperor had been limited by the traditions and institutions. Only when confronted by great national tragedy does China seem to unite. Those few historical dreams pulled together the des desperate despots from the desert to the Yellow River Basin and united them under one banner, even if only for a few months. Now, a new national drama's approach to the inevitable confrontation with Japan. All had come to agree that Japanese hegemony must end. Even Chen Gongbu, vanguard of the Pan-Asianism, admitted, China could only now gain true prosperity through liberation, and independent China, the true freedom, was the only choice. Gao proposed a new united front. The second had briefly reared its head, only to die in the ruins of Chongqing. The first had completed its goal, but fell apart immediately afterwards. This one was to last, not only guaranteeing freedom from Japanese aggression, but true solidarity among the five races. Warlords would point their weapons away from each other and towards the common enemy that threatened their very basis of existence. New offices would be formed in the name of courting warlords. Bribes would have to be made, and delegations would be sent. In the name of liberation, China would reach out to the feuding states of Asia and bring them together. Gao Zongwu explained that this was the only option of freedom. China must be free onwards. And that, my friends, is the end of this campaign. Oh my goodness, I'm excited for whatever TNO2 has. Like, we have set ourselves up to do quite well. Thank you for playing. Great. Um, yeah, I'm excited for what the rework of China or redone or, you know, modernized for China will be because we did really well. I hope to see in the future, you know, if TNO2 ever comes out, that China gets maybe a little bit of a rework for its content just because I would like to see more GDP growth. Obviously, we can spend our PP to get more GDP growth because the debt is still quite high. I really wonder how China would end up trying to liberate itself and maybe even annex or puppet. We have these guys as puppets or annex them into the Republic of China so we can have one big, huge united front against a Japanese uh, you know, enemy. 
Or, I would also like to see how we could still remain basically a slave or become a co-equal partner with the Japanese in the co sphere. Because there was the option to kind of remain, you know, slaves or um, very, very under the arm of Japanese hegemony. But, time will tell what the devs will do because, well, the devs are hopefully, and I'm, I'm sure most likely are, very hard at work trying to get out as much content as possible. But, if you enjoyed this campaign, please do consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow in another campaign. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.